quite important was before each and, and before each of the exams that I wrote outside of uh, of university was to go and sit down with somebody because you know the, the nice thing about or the nice or the bad thing about actual exams is that results are public. So you know they list your name on on a website somewhere. It used to be on a newspaper apparently uh, back in the day, uh, and they say so and so passed this exam. So if you're going to attempt you know a particular exam. You might notice a friend, you might notice a colleague or, or former colleague or so on, who just passed the exam that, that you're going to write. It costs you nothing to write to that person and say, uh, you know, can I just chat to you about what you did to do that exam? I did that for every exam. Uh, because you, you don't want to spend your time discovering stuff that somebody else has discovered. You know, you know, um, I, when you qualified as an actuary, uh, obviously you do the paperwork and everything like that. When your salary clocked, probably on your phone, mm -hmm. did that salary shock you or it didn't shock you at all? Uh, <laughs> look, uh, uh, let me try and remember. To be honest, no. Okay, um, another episode, and for this one, I'm super excited. I'm joined by, you know, Prof. Randani uh, Mbuva. Do you, do you like people calling you Prof? Because I've, I struggle with this, you know, like sometimes I would say, I wanna, especially the way I was raised, you know, I, I'm baby, and in my culture, it's just bad to call somebody by their name. Um, you have to say, you know, either use the same name or if someone is a prof, prof, sorry, and so and stuff like that. Uh, what's your view on this? No, you know, I, I don't actually mind, to be honest. Um, because for me, it, it's never been by title. It's, it's actually, and I mean, you know, I'm an associate professor, so it, you know, it's even yeah. controversial, <laughs> you know, <laughs> even calling myself prof. So, you know, Randani for me is fine. Um, funny enough, the only people who call me prof almost religiously is my folks, you know, my, my parents. I don't know why, uh, but, <laughs> you know, they're the ones who, you know, who keep going back to this title. But for me, it's, it's, it's Randani and that's it. No, but the word prof has some gravitas, you know, um, mm -hmm. it has that, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, no, there the, the is, you know, there is like some sort of gravitas, but sometimes, you know, and it's actually quite, um, I actually still like the title doctor. Uh, I remember I went to a pharmacy uh, a few days ago, well, a few months ago now, and, and when I got there, you know, uh, the pharmacist was a bit confused because he was dispensing medicine to Dr. Renan. He's like, is the, is the doctor, <laughs> is the doctor sick? And I was like, yeah, not that kind of doctor. Yeah. You know? uh, but I, I, I actually, you know, the title doctor, I didn't get to use it for a long time, especially uh, from a Vitz perspective, but uh, it's, I think it's still, it's still pretty much, much useful, you know, and I guess to some extent that's within your control, right? You get your PhD, Nobody needs to promote you to that title and so on and so on. So, you know, that's, that's sort of like, I guess, the limit at which, you know, you perhaps, you know, you know, self-driven academia can get you. And then the rest is, is by promotion and scholarship. Yeah, I see. Um, in fact, uh, you know, someone also had, had a similar experience as that where somebody looked at the, the doctor thing at my name and they thought I was a medical doctor, actually. Only to find out that actually that's not the case because that's what sometimes has been confused. Yeah, with, yeah. You know? we're pretty useless when it comes to medicine. You know? <laughs> but <laughs> it is what it is. And, yeah. yeah. But sometimes. So, um, uh, and, yeah. Okay, sorry. No, no, I was just saying that, you know, sometimes it's controversial to, to, to when I say this to my friends, and it's probably be, well, that if you're recording this, this is also controversial. Is, you know, I, I tell my doctor friends, medical doctor friends, that you know they don't have PhDs, so they're not doctors. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's a very very controversial subject, which um, you know I actually saw politicians debating this a few months ago, but that you know, that was nothing to do with that. Yeah, true. So judging from your name, um, Randani Mbuba, um, so Mako Pachivenda, you're from Venda. Yeah, I'm from Pachivenda. Live time though, actually, or. More precisely, you know, a small village called Zingaya, even slightly further north of Tando, Mara, you know, spent 
uh, yeah, Venda is, is, is where I grew up and, and, and that's where I spent, you know, all my early learnings and stuff like that. Can I guess? Can I guess that you actually went to Mbili High School? Yes, unfortunately, you're correct. Uh, <laughs> I did go to, to Mbili. And yeah, yeah it's, it's, I must say it was um, an efficient um, education that we received at Mbili. It was uh, very direct to what we wanted to become. Uh, and came at a decent cost at the time. So, you know, I'm very thankful to have been there. What is it about Mbilu? Because I always find that, you know, people who, that's why I'm saying, can I guess? Because um, mm. a lot of, you know, uh, people who go to Mbilu actually just end up being very successful, you know, academically, you know, and mm-hmm. saying that you're from Venda, that, that my second guess was that, that Mbilu should be the school. What, what is it about it that actually, um, I mean, in your opinion, that makes you guys to, you know, excel like this? I mean, it's, I guess at the end of the day, it boils down to culture, right? It's about the way things are done. And, and when you arrive there, it's not about you. I mean, especially some of us who are relatively young stars in terms of people who went there. You found a long lineage of excellence. You found people who had, you know, won science Olympiads nationally in the 90s, oh, wow. in the early 90s who were studying the undergraduate degrees abroad at that time. So, you know, when you get there, you know, winning the Metal Olympiad is something you do. I didn't, I'm not saying I did win it, but, you know, you do participate with, you know, with no reservations as to your capabilities about what you can do there. Um, you know, doing well in your subjects is, 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 is also something that, you know, it's, you know, it's common. Uh, and being in an environment where excellence like that is common, um, it's quite inspiring and it just makes um, and I guess it's been the same when, as I look at universities corporate organizations some of which I've been involved in is uh, the best are those where you know excellence is common it's just something you go and do every single day uh, and, and that is essentially in summary of our time we spent at Biri it was you know you just push and push and push and, and the best result is normal Wow. So maybe that's the model that I think a lot of schools will need to follow, you know, mm-hmm. um, creating that culture and making sure that people actually follow into it. Um, so that's very nice. That's very nice. So um, today I'm joined by um, Prof. Ndani Mbuva, uh, who is a qualified actuary with a designation as a chartered enterprise risk actuary. Um, he's also a fellow of the Actuarial Society of South Africa. Um, worked as an actuary for Barclays Africa Group and for Milliman, and also worked as an actual analyst at Discovery Health, and is an independent non-executive director at Bitvest Life, and also an honorary senior research associate at University College London, a fellow in machine learning in Queen Mary University of London. Um, Prof. Um, Bua holds a PhD in electrical engineering and artificial intelligence from the University of Johannesburg under the supervision of the mighty Prof. Chilisi Marala. I, I forget the name of the other supervisor. It, it was so difficult for me to pronounce. Oh, yeah, no, it was, it was Dr. Elias Bulkaibet. He is um, he's from Algeria and currently based in, in Kuwait. Oh, I see, I see. And you also did another master's. Uh, you did a master's also in electrical engineering and machine learning from KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Where is this um, university? Uh, KTH is uh, is in Sweden. It's in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, hmm. uh, yeah, so that, that's it's, it's an engineering school that's based uh, in, in the middle of Stockholm. I see, I see. And also a BSc honors in actual science and mathematical statistics from the University of Cape Town. You know, when I, uh, before I hosted you, actually, uh, I did a post on my WhatsApp that I'm going to be hosting you and actually did a very short bio on you. And um, a lot of the people were like, uh, this is the most qualified and overqualified person you have ever hosted on your channel. And I agree. <laughs> I, you know, in many respects, I still believe I'm underqualified, to be honest. There, there, there's, again, you know, there, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot that we need to learn. There's a lot that we need to do. And uh, yeah, I, I disagree respectfully. <laughs> but, yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean, okay. I mean, a lot of people aspire into this profession of actuarial science. And I think it's one of the most, um, you know, I can say lucrative, one of the most sought after 
and one of the most I've had difficult profession or course, uh, whatever you call it. So then if you were able to do that, you're a qualified actuary, like qualified. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people that I've met who uh, have done actuarial science, they're not as yet qualified. I think they're still busy with their board exams. We're going to talk about that also in a minute mm-hmm. about the board exams and everything like that. And not only did you do that, but you actually now even branch into it. But I would like us to start it here. Um, your sister did actuarial mm-hmm. science as well? Yes, yes, yes. Um, my sister did actuarial science at the University of Witwatersrand, the very same corridors where I now work. Uh, you know, my sister did it before me uh, and in many ways was, was pivotal in my success, you know, in, 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 in my degree and also in my exams. You know, it's always good. I, I, I might have referred to this when I talked about, you know, Mbili as a school, but it's always good to be around with people who have done what you're attempting to do. Yeah. Uh, and that for me was quite important with my sister. Is this a family of actuarist? And now I'm tempted to ask, what was the professions of your parents? No, no, no. My, my parents, you know, they work, both of them work at the University of Venda uh, as administrator. Uh, my mother does have a PhD in educational psychology, but however, she works in, 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 in student support at the university. And my dad, who was about to retire um, at some point this year or next year, it moves. Uh, but uh, he's been in finance at the university for a very long time. Uh, but, you know, they were both uh, administrators at the University of Venda. Yeah, so as a family of academics, I see, I see. Um, like I've told you that I've received a lot of questions. Um, so we're going to start with the questions that came that are about external science because the, when I was looking at the questions, I can classify them into two groups. There are those actual science questions and there are artificial intelligence questions. So mm-hmm. we'll start with the one in actual science. So the first question I think you've already answered it was that what led him to choose a career in actual science? Can he share his journey and experiences in becoming a, in becoming an actuary? Mm. Okay. All right. Cool. So, okay. Well, I, I'll be tempted to stop at, at the point at which I become an actuary, but I actually think it's, you know, the journey is slightly longer than that. Um, you know, I, as I've mentioned, I went to Mbiri. Uh, at Mbiri, you know, in the past, people used to say you could only be a policeman, uh, a nurse or a teacher or something like that. But in my case, in those times, either you become an accountant, you become, uh, or, you know, you become an engineer, or then you become, you know, at that time, although I, I, I would disagree with hindsight, you, the daring ones will try to become actuaries. Um, and then what happened is, yeah, I chose to become an actuary. I didn't know much about it, to be honest. My sister was studying it. Um, also could, you know, try to explain in very vague circumstances, you know, what it would mean, because she was also doing an undergrad degree. And, and as many of you who have studied the course, you realize that in the first few years, you know, you, you, you deepen the mathematics and you cannot really look in the horizon as to what's coming. Um, but uh, it came through because I got funding from Discovery, uh, who were very good to me, I must say. Um, and and what what actually and it's actually quite a, a you know I would say a naive way of deciding on a course was that uh, when I was in my metric I got called up to Johannesburg which was my probably my third fourth time in the city uh, and probably my second time in Centen only um, into the executive boardroom these guys interview you ask you why you want to do this course. But what I found quite, well, well, the shine of the boardroom, sort of like you you could make a lot of money here, which over time, uh, there was a bit of a myth. Uh, But but, but what, you know, the way those guys carried themselves, um, the sort of, you know, value and interesting things they said they were doing, you know, led me without understanding too much about it, uh, you know, to having an inkling as to, you know, you you can push forward. And again, you know, uh, you know, then I went to UCT, but I was still, and this this ties into you know perhaps where I am on my journey now, was I was still having an inkling of should I study engineering and go into, uh, you know, what, what the time was called information engineering, you know, trying to understand you know how you know you can make complex systems or complex adaptive systems. Sometimes people would talk about, but then you know the money was in the actual science, the fund that was secured, so I said you know. Let me go to, which was a controversial decision. Uh, let me go to the University of Cape Town. 
um, you know, try hedge my bets in studying computer science and actual science. Um, and that was important because I, I felt that I still needed, actually I understood that the, the mathematics of the actual science would be great, the statistics is the core of this complex adaptive system that I wanted to get into, uh, but however, I, need, I needed some experience in, in programming, which I had none at high school. Um, so what, what I then did, after looking at the curricula, UCT was the one that could allow me to hedge my bets for, for a while, uh, until I have to nail my colors to the mask. So I went to UCT. Um, studied, you know, you know, the full sort of first year of computer science, did the second year of computer science, and then I must be honest, in second year I started feeling it a bit heavy, you know, trying to to major on both uh, in both in, in both uh, subjects, and obviously I'm covered, I'm funded by an insurance company, so obviously I then decided, okay, well maybe let's you know mothball the computer science a bit, but you know where you've got time and space, pick some courses that allow you to to sort of you know learn a bit more. So I then took some engineering electives. Remember, I'm studying actual science, but then I, I took some you know a course called Neurofuzzy and Evolving Systems in my second year, in lieu of you know of just trying to mend my you know my my, my sort of uh, you know love with computer science that I've just now left. And that went really well. I then finished my degree, and I must say, I mean, those in, in who, who studied actuarial science would know there's things called exemptions. Um, I did miss about two or three of those, uh, which to me was a bit, you know, at, at the time it's hit and miss, try and smash, but, you know, um, and then when I grow slightly older, i.e. I was in honors, um, you know, I then realized that, you know, exemptions are important, and then uh, you know, the key ones, like, you know, what they call 8311 in the honor CLS, managed, managed to secure that. Uh, and then when I started going at discovery, and again, uh, you know, this environmental effect of people around you is quite important. Discovery have some of the top talent in terms of actuaries. Uh, and you see that when you write exams, because when you write exams, now you're working and you have to write these exams. You see, you know, your colleagues, you know, excelling in these exams. You see them, you know, coming in with all those exemptions that you might have missed. And you're like, no, I, I need, I don't need to look like the anchor around here. I need to pass these exams, uh, and that's what happened. I most of those exams I passed at first attempt when I, uh, when I was working at uh, at Discovery, and within about two and a half years after that, I, I then finished my fellowship, uh, and, and that's essentially was you know was that journey. Um, well, yeah, I think you have got a question. You know, if if there is something. <clears throat> If there is something that I'm going to pick out of this yeah. um, uh, conversation, and I'm already picking it at this point, uh, the importance of actually being in spaces of excellence seems for, mm. seems very important, eh? Yeah, yeah. No, no, it, it, it is. It, it, it is. And, and I think, you know, the moment you get this sometimes, you've got this, you, you've got two options, right? You, either you sink or you swim. Um, and, and, and by, by sinking, what will sink you is, you know, imposter syndrome, this is not me, this is not really how somebody from Toyando should really be, yeah. be doing this. But then you're like, you know, but there must be a reason you're here, right? Um, and that's often, and I mean, moments of self-doubt always happen um, to the best of us. Uh, but again, you know, that sort of, you know, seeing what you might think is out of this world as a norm around you. It's probably one of the most powerful pieces of motivation you can get. Let's touch on the board exams. You have yeah. passed the board exams at first attempt. That is yes. impressive. Asterisk on that is that um, I did mention that I, I missed about three exemptions while at, uh, while at UCT. Uh, and then obviously I wrote them while I was working. Then I passed them at first, first attempt. And then the ones that I took after the university thing, which are the latter exams, those I did pass at first attempt, except one, which was a subject which is critical to actuaries called communications. Uh, and those who know it, know it. Um, and it, it's really about you know, the art of communicating fairly complex ideas uh, to your peers. Uh, and I, I guess with hindsight, I don't mind. I think I did it twice or, or maybe three times actually. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not, it, you know, the nice thing about it is, you know, basically the exam is write a letter to your friend explaining this pension fund payout or why this and that didn't happen, you know. So it's not something that you spend a lot of time, you know, you know studying. So what usually happened is I would attempt the bigger exams, which are the more content exams, and, and, and just go and write it. 
and eventually, you know, you know, the more I trust my coin, it was wasn't a coin toss, but you know, I eventually got heads and and, and passed the the, um, and the exam without wasting not a lot of time. So, how many board exams do you guys have to write to qualify as an actuary, and which one can you say is the difficult one? Is the communication is the difficult one? Oof. Um, you know, I, I'm a bit out of date in terms of how many exams, because it changes, but, you know, usually about around 15, if I remember correctly. Um, and, you know, it varies from person to person. Um, so uh, actual science is one of those courses that show you up because it tests both what I would say the normative and, and the technical. So it would test, you know, your ability to, to solve integrals, to calculate expectations and all those mathematical things. But then at the end of the at the day, which is a bit of a which is a bit of a you know you know of a bazinga to some people at the end is you know those things are mere tools that you use to communicate ideas, to solve real problems. Uh, so at the end of the day, towards the end, they test you on case studies of what's happening in the real world. Then you have to start fitting those tools that you got in your toolbox of the technical into you know business decisions risk management decisions and so on um, and therefore it varies from person to person i actually enjoyed the latter exams but i guess based on statistics i would say that you know the fellowship exam is the hardest exam the one the terminal exam uh, but for me those were the subjects that i sort of enjoyed because I, I i enjoyed putting the technical into practice um, although I, I don't mind the technical, I teach and, and, and sometimes research in the technical, but the, the, the sort of, um, you know, fellowship exams, fellowship applications exams, those are the ones that I sort of enjoy. So, so what can you say about, um, because you, you, you I, I mean, for me, it's always interesting to meet people who have written board exams and they actually went on to, you know, whack, you know, on the mm -hmm. profession. So. Yeah. You, you you worked as an actuary for I think you're a, a product actuary for Barclays Africa Group and also mm -hmm. I've seen that also for Milliman and stuff um, mm -hmm. and I'm aware that there are also um, different branches of actuarial science mm -hmm. you know um, yeah. the evaluations and all of those type of things um, mm -hmm. what is it like now to be working as an actuary Yeah no it, it varies depending on the role right. Um, and, and, and what is it like? It's, it's, it's an, it depends on the role. I mean, in the product actually, you know, the irony of, of my role as, as product actually at Apso is that, uh, you know, it, it was all encompassing in that, you know, when you run a product, you might have to write a letter to a client explaining why you, you know, why they pay out to so and so. So, you know, so those, you know, three attempts in communications came in handy. Uh, and then it comes to valuations. Valuations, in most cases, is calculating present values of cash flows. Um, and, and, and that's sort of like the diversity of the thing. So you can have guys working in marketing, guys working in products, guys working in systems, uh, and this days guys working data analytics. So it varies between. Um, uh, and it's sometimes a rude awakening. Again, I talk about sort of like you know, the surprise you get when there's some deviation from the technical. When, for example, when I did my first piece of back work, and I walked into this insurance company and everybody has a spreadsheet open. You're like, okay, where do we solve the integrals? <laughs> well, uh, well, in most cases, they'll be empirical and that means that would mean, you know, you have to calculate a whole lot of averages. But, you know, that's just how the real practical world works. Um, and I think that's the thing. You spend a lot of time trying to translate what, you know, vaguely is in the notes uh, into, you know, products, you know, financial valuations and so on. Oops, yeah. Um, one of the questions that one of the questions that came through, which I think is quite of interest, especially from what you've just spoken about, is the question says, um, "What are some of the key skills and attributes that are essential for success as an actuary?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think uh, most of which are generic, right? And I, and I, and I would like to address a point you raised before but I'll, I'll pack it for now if it raises its head again I'll, I'll talk to it uh, but uh, you know success in in being an actuary is almost generic to most professions you just need to to pick your niche it's quite important to sort of like you know know what you're doing if your evaluations actually you be evaluations actually spend a lot of time doing valuations and therefore you know be the best in the business um, if you are a product actually you know gain a lot of experience 
And also it's quite important in, in, in many a field to know what's on the horizon, right? So there's, um, there's, what, there's what we're solving for now, uh, but there's also what is coming in the future and how do we sort of like integrate that. So it's quite important, you know, in different roles, you know, for actually it might be something as simple as new regulations, you know, how does that affect how you value your product? How does that affect how you design it and so on? Uh, and even many issues of technology, how does that affect it? And it's the guys who are on top of that, the earliest that, you know, perhaps get it, but it's really find your niche. It, there's many sort of like corners at which somebody can find something that can keep them busy and happy, which is quite important. Uh, and that's about that's about it. And in some cases, you know, I've, well, it's good to sample a couple of things while you're figuring out what you what you want to do. But once you want to sort of, you know, settle, uh, you know, you really want to, you know, you know, you know, spend ten thousand hours doing one thing. So you must niche yourself. That's what you say. Well, that, that's just my that's, that's just my view. It, it varies. I mean, the generalist approach is there, and yeah. there's some jobs as such. And and I guess you know that's also a niche to some extent. You know, you know, being able to uh, to do diverse pieces of work. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Um, and one of the questions said, um, "How does he see the future of actuarial science? Are there any particular areas or industries where the demand for actuaries is expected to grow? I mean, I know most of you work in insurance, pensions and stuff. Um, where else do you guys work? Yeah, look, I am, I'm about to say something controversial. So it is, I have a feeling that, you know, actuarial science if at the heart of it is a form of statistics. The form of statistics that tries to, you know, well, coupled with uh, the normative angle of societal impact and, you know, sometimes by, uh, you know, balancing public need and so on. And there's some training to that. But it, to some extent, is, is an ability to, uh, to, un to, to leverage data uh, and statistical tools to, uh, to make sort of inferences about an uncertain future and, and being able to communicate that. And I think communicating is is quite a big piece of the value. And therefore, that being said is, you know, uncertainty is popping up in different areas. It's popping up as to how, you know, geopolitical issues happen, how, um, you know, energy issues, for example, how, you know, you know, technology affects us. And where there's that uncertainty, where perhaps there's a body of data, actually can actually, uh, you know, sort of, you know, you know, give input. Well, obviously, we must know the, the limitations in, in, in terms of our core technical knowledge. But, um, you know, being able to, to process data into communicable products uh, that people can, you know, and, uh, take decisions on, act on, is, is a skill that perhaps, you know, might encompass, you know, issues from technology to engineering, telecoms. I mean, telecoms, you're seeing a lot of actors going to telecoms this day. So I think... Um, one thing that the profession is certainly, you know, slowly opening up to is that, you know, you do not necessarily have, you know, I think there are about five boxes, general insurance, long-term insurance, uh, pensions, uh, you know, healthcare and so on. But you, there's actually a lot of opportunity to create some value. Uh, across, you know, numerous sectors. Um, but the traditional fields are there, but we're starting to see, I mean, at the moment, I'm, I'm in the UK where, you know, pensions reform might imply that, um, you know, there's going to be, you know, lesser jobs for, uh, for pensions actually. The same thing happened in South Africa with the transition uh, from defined benefits to, to defined contribution schemes. So, you know, being, because change is always going to happen. So, you, you know, you, once I once I said I did say you must find a niche, but you kind of like need to you know look into the horizon and say you know what is coming, how can I you know what sort of what can my skills be transferable to, uh, and I think that's you know the broad application of these types of things it, it, it's certainly inevitable. I mean, uh, data now, data is the buzzword. You know, I think mm -hmm. uh, someone yeah. said to me that um, data is the new gold. Mm -hmm. um, and also the whole concept of fourth industrial revolution, um, mm -hmm. digitalization. I mean, you're already in the space. I mean, um, mm -hmm. with uh, the kind of work that you're doing, AI. And uh, I was actually watching an interview that you did at the ENCA. 
where you, I think you were talking about your PhD that you, you guys came up with a system uh, that can detect, you know, a disease um, mm. uh, using AI. But also now you've juxtaposed this into, you know, a risk in, 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 in insurance and stuff, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting. So, so what role do you see actuaries playing, especially in this concoction of data for IR, AI and the likes? Mm. Yeah, something that unfortunately, you know, has affected our profession in that case is that um, you know, we, we, we're pretty, you know, we tend to attract a lot of reserved people, including myself. Um, and, and therefore, you know, when, when, when sort of buzzwords and hype come along, you know, we do not necessarily, uh, you know, you know, you know, let me follow, you know, as quickly as, as perhaps, you know, other sort of like, you know, I don't, I don't want to disparage anyone, but in terms of, you know, in, in terms of the, just the general movement of things. And that the reason I say this is, you know, data is not something new to actuaries. You know, I mean, we've been talking about model points, the actuaries would know what this is, but that's, that's really just a data set, you know. Uh, we've been talking about, it has always been a fundamental tool uh, in what we call the actual control cycle. So, you know, being able to process that data has never been, has been a core skill for actuaries for a long time. And it's really part of the rigorous training we do in our statistical level. Now, the second thing is, you know, what are the changes that are there from what we used to do in the past is, you know, the data is more voluminous. And, uh, you know, there's, you know, some increased computing power that allows us to process it in a nonlinear manner. Uh, which therefore, you know, says, okay, fine, uh, you know, f from the actuaries then that talks to, you know, that ability for me to communicate stuff. It's now fundamentally more complex because I'm now saying that, you know, it's not X plus Y, but it's X going through some form of transformation and then gives me Z, you know. Um, and I think then the opportunities for actuaries is again, being able to, you know, find, and maybe that's more for us in academia, to find ways of interpreting and explaining this model to communities, clients, governments, and so on. Uh, but again, you know, um, and we're working very hard in expanding the toolbox for actuaries. I mean, if you know by now, even at WITS and other institutions, we've introduced machine learning courses for them. Uh, we're working on some syllabi revisions as well as the Actuarial Society of South Africa. Uh, to be able to, again, equip them with, you know, survival tools for them to do what they used to do, but this in this new regime where you've got compute, you've got, um, as well as, you know, vast and, and data with a bit of variety. Uh, but I, I don't think, you know, in most cases, I mean, having been in, in sort of like industry at the time at which obviously data science and machine learning was picking up, uh, this was not something that really, you know, we, we, we might have, um, you know, perhaps tried to use our old tools uh, for a bit too long, but it was not something that was not, that was very difficult for us to adapt to. Talking about you being in industry, uh, how long have you been in industry for? An industry, I'm um, thinking that uh, corporate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 exactly. So... You know, I'd like to think I'm not not in industry <laughs> at the moment. So, 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 so the thing is, I've always because you know, actual science is being an actuary is being part of a profession, uh, and the profession you know does professional work, uh, and, and that cycle to me informs uh, you know what sort of training we should be doing, what sort of research we should be doing. So therefore, I try to keep in touch. Um, I started working formally, you know, for insurance companies, um, for an insurance company in 20, let me see, I think it's been about 12 years now, in 2011, in, in 2012, sorry. And that's when I, I started, it's about 11 years that I, I, I started there. And in that period, apart from the, from, from, from the time that I spent abroad, you know, studying full time, I've had some opportunities to do some consulting work for these companies. I've had some opportunities now to serve on, uh, on boards as an non-executive director. So I, not that I'm an academic and I understand that, but uh, I, I certainly want to keep tabs on, you know, what's happening in industry. How can I equip my students better? How can I support industry by doing research that's relevant to what, you know, to their needs or the problems they face? Um, so in that regard, you know, from a full-time basis, I, I sort of did 
corporate work for about four years when I started out. And then I realized, well, then I, then I caught the academic back and, and ended up where I am now. But in that period, I've, I've, I've spent, you know, some time with, with in a corporate environment, be it as a consultant or, or, or as a director of a company. Yeah, because I was going to come to that to say then, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I'm just thinking here that a lot of um, people, uh, external science, they would think of it, okay, I'm doing external science, I'm going to go into industry, I'm going to work, and uh, life ends there, you know, and go through the corporate ladder. But you took a detour mm-hmm. into academia. Uh, what inspired that move? Oof. Okay, um, th- th- there's probably a distribution of answers I can give you to that, but let me, uh, one of the things is I have always had, you know, you know, maybe it goes back to what I said about how I started with actual science and th- th- sort of like deciding on computer science and, uh, and, and, and you know, the technical actual stuff. But then the, the thing with me was, um, in my work environment, I was fortunate enough to, to end up in a department that was, you know, a bit also forward thinking at the time. Um, and in that, you know, we started working within a company that was collecting quite a bit of data uh, and was quite interesting to find out, you know, what sort of patterns exist. Uh, and in my view, we sort of, I mean, you know, came to a realization that, yes, the data is there, but perhaps, you know, we probably need to, to, to expand our skill set a bit, you know, which is not too bad. I mean, you can go, you can go read about a bit on something uh, and then come back and apply it at work and something like that's, that's not the worst thing in the world. But for me, I, I sort of, you know, wanted to, to sort of like learn by some form of investment, so immerse myself in this thing. Uh, and then a scholarship opportunity came up in Sweden uh, for me to, to go and study there, you know, machine learning as a master's. Um, which was a bit unheard of after, this was literally a year after I qualified as an actual. So, you know, at some point, you know, you know, you think, you know, you've made it and then all of a sudden, you know, the rules have changed. Um, and then now you've got, you're going to go back to a classroom again. But for me, it was, I wasn't even sure that I was going to end up in academia by doing that master's. Uh, for me, I saw it uh, at, at first instance as an opportunity to go learn some new skills and then perhaps make myself a bit more differentiated person in terms of my career and, and where that applies. But then uh, once I got into it and started doing you know, research elements of my master's, I realized that, oh, actually, I just enjoy just looking at new problems and spending my whole day <laughs> working on those. Um, and, and that's how I ended up where I am now. Wow, what a journey. What a journey. Um, <clears throat> the other question that came through was, what advice would, would he give to an actual student? Are there any particular steps or resources he would suggest to kickstart their journey after their degree? So, look, uh, um, after your degree, it, it, it's pretty... I think you, you kind of like have to have... The machine learning guys would know what this... You, you need to have epochs of solving a particular problem, right? Uh, and, and, and compartmentalizing your time horizon is quite important. So you kind of like have to say, you know... I need to qualify as an actuary, if that's what you want to do. Um, and I need to do this in the next three years. Uh, and that should be, you know, um, entirely amongst other things, be, you know, you know the main focus of, of that epoch of your life. You know, I'm not saying, you know, sidestep anything, but you kind of like have to, you know, you know tell yourself, you know, I'm going to write this exam. I'm going to have to be ready for it by this date. Um, and, and, you know, and that's the one thing, you know, you might know the pass rate is 15%, but you always are operating under the assumption that, you know, whatever I plan will succeed. And obviously you work, you work back, uh, you know, to that, from that success to, you know, you know, actually executing on it. So, so the studying is, is, is really what I'm talking to. But again, it's, it's I, what I found quite important was before each and, and before each of the exams that I wrote outside of, you know, of university was to go and sit down with somebody because you know the, the nice thing about or the nice or the bad thing about actual exams is that results are public so you know they list your name on on a website somewhere it used to be on a newspaper apparently uh, back in the day uh, oh. and they say so and so passed this exam so if you're going to attempt you know a particular exam you might notice a friend you might notice a colleague or, or former colleague or so on who just passed the exam that that you're going to write it costs you nothing so write to that person and say, 
uh, you know, can I just chat to you about what you did to do that exam? I did that for every exam uh, because you, you don't want to spend your time discovering stuff that somebody else has discovered. You know, you know that you know, this material works better than the other. Uh, and these are, you know, a recent tip. They're localized. They're somebody who's just executed on what you're attempting to do. So spend not too much time, but spend some time with that person. Ask them what material helped them, what lessons they learned from that. Uh, and then, you know, the, at worst, you don't repeat their mistakes, but you make new ones, which you can solve for later. Uh, so for me, that was quite important. Uh, sometimes, depending on what sort of actor you want to qualify as, uh, the right job matters. Uh, it matters in terms of not only study policy or what your employer allows you to do in terms of, you know, because you, you, you can't have it all in most cases. You know, you have, you know, a high-flying job where you, you're traveling the whole time or you're writing exams. And you can in some cases, but, you know, maybe that might be a compromise you make at the, as, a, as a short term. Uh, those who play football play a low a low block, you know, while you <laughs> while you're starting out, uh, and then obviously on the counter write the exams, and you can you can you can do you know whatever you want to do. Um, so you know that in terms of support from the from the sort of employer, but also context matters. Um, in that you know your work context must in, well, if in some cases not all, but it does help to, you know, if you're writing a health exam, you know, maybe work for a health insurer uh, because, you know, the sort of experience you learn in the corridor, in the meetings, that you can write about that in exams. Obviously, you don't write people's names, or organizations, or quantums. Uh, mm -hmm. But these are case study exams that, you know, in some cases, you know, you drop up into exam and somebody asks you what you do every day. But that's if you've got the right sort of role in the right sort of organization and so on. So that's also important to, to see it. Uh, and remember, you're solving for a particular epoch. You don't, don't necessarily have to be married to this for the rest of your life. But, you know, for you to execute, these are some enabling factors. Yeah. Let, let, let's take it back a bit. Let's take mm -hmm. it back to your undergrad, undergraduate mm -hmm. years. Um, what type of student were you? Were you those students who were always, like, studying full-time, you know, um, in the library? You know, those ones <coughs> who were really chowing course? Um, um, or were you... You know, um, I mean, you have done heavy things like actuarial science and stuff like that. I'm trying to relate this to to a student who's going to watch this, who's doing actuarial science, and, and, and maybe they're going through it, and maybe they're thinking it's difficult or whatever challenges that they're going through. Take us through your study days. Sure. Uh, look, I, I'm tempted to be honest with this, with, with this <laughs> question. And because and because I, 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 I don't want to sell something that is not necessarily accurate. Uh, but but what happened? My, my university experience was actually quite interesting um, because, and it, it it takes me back to unfortunately something or fortunately something that happened in high school. Uh, so what happened in high school? The reason I'm going to that it, it then affected how I operated at university, which wasn't great, right? Um, so so what happened in high school is I think on or about August 20, 2005, and I'm now revealing my age. Uh, I, I, I was in grade 11, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Yeah. August 2000, was it? Yeah, August 2006. Sorry. Now I'm, you know, I'm looking like a confused man. August 2006, I got an opportunity to go attend what was called an international summer school for young physicists. Um, and it was based in Waterloo, Canada. Um, and this, you know, for some reason, I don't know how they did it, but they managed to assemble some young people who were interested in physics. Um, and then gave them a summer school, which was essentially two weeks. Um, and there they taught you, I don't know, linear algebra in two weeks, right? A linear algebra in two weeks that was probably sufficient for you to go through first year. Uh, they taught you, um, you know, calculus, which was almost like, and, you know, first and second year calculus. Um, and you're in grade 11, by the way. Um, and then they... You know, they did some string theory and some stuff. I didn't understand that stuff, so I can't really talk to that. Uh, but, uh, you know, they did some physics, string theory. I think there were some, you know, harmonics and, and, and some other things. Uh, so I go back to try and do after that. You know, you know I, having sampled that, I was like, okay, fine. Uh, so that made my metric a bit easy. 
but then also having that knowledge, I sort of cruised through first year, cruised through second year, right? But then that created a bad habit in my view in terms of how I operated because I could, you know, oh, the other thing is because I had so much time in metric, I don't want to say it like this, but because I had so much time in metric, I, I did some additional mathematics individually. I never actually wrote the exams because it was not offered at the school. But then I, I did some stats. So the, my first year stats was also easy for me and so on. But then that period, although it sounds good, for me, it sort of showed me up in my third year at university because First, second year was, was fine. I was, this, you know, I was that A student, but I was not, I, I didn't feel like I was applying myself the same way as I was with my peers. And then comes uh, third year. Uh, and then I'm like, oh, <laughs> uh, now this was not taught in Canada. <laughs> and you know, t Canada was a long time ago. And, uh, and secondly, you know, you kind of like have to start doing the tuts. You know? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm tempted to tell you that, you know, I, I was the guy who was doing the tuts from there. But, you know, I had this experience where I, you know, I was sort of, you know, I had a lot of priors in some of the work. Uh, that for me, the first, second year, you know, for me, as someone who was doing actual science, some of the things that were troublesome for me that I actually sat down and studied was stuff like economics, accounting, because I didn't, I didn't go to an accounting school. You know, that, that was what I sort of, you know, preoccupied myself. Uh, but then, you know, that experience then shaped uh, sort of like my first, um, you know, two years. My third year was a bit, that's why I talked about missed exemptions. That's why I started missing exemptions, because I was not really... Uh, you know, you know that guy was applying himself, and then only towards, and, and I'm, I'm being honest here, only towards the end of my honors year, I then realized, oh no, Rendani, you kind of like have to do this religiously if you want to make a success of this thing. Uh, and to be honest, I don't know what slapped that reality on my face, but I certainly needed that because I, the sort of work ethic that sort of like I guess reignited when I was in, uh, when I was in my honors year was something that I, I certainly wouldn't have done without for the later years, you know. So I actually, I was, I was a fairly bad university student in my third year. Um, and I think, yeah, then it was good. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I, there, there's some regrets I have there, but it was mainly because of, you know, some prior events that had an effect on, on that, yeah. Wow. Hey, we wish to also be through something like that because i see also with uh, uh with a lot of students who did the cambridge system uh mm -hmm. usually students from zimbabwe um when they come to university they cruise because just like yeah. you said they were introduced mm -hmm. to this concept when they were still in high school yeah. you know first day calculus and to some extent second day calculus um how long did it take you to be an actuary to qualify as an actuary after you graduated uh i i wrote my final exam uh I passed my final exam two and a half years after I graduated. Oh, okay. And on average, how long does it take one to qualify to be an actuary? Well, officially, it takes three years. So, so okay. So, so maybe let me let me yeah. So, so the, the official version is it takes three years. So you write the exams. Um, depending on what university you go to, you could be done with that in the first six months of working. Um, and then, but you have to do three years of what they call work-based skills. So, um, you know, after, you know, they can only, after ticking that box of experience, you can only then do it, um, uh, do it within, uh, yeah, you can only then qualify in three years of, after working, essentially. Um, yeah, but that it, it varies because it, I cannot prescribe a period, but you know, the minimum is three years, but then there could be all sorts of activity. Some people write their last exam six months in because the universities gave them exemption and a lot of my students at WITS get that dispensation. Um, and then, you know, some people can write, you know, the exams until, you know, three years, but it can take, it, it, it's, it's unbound on terms of, <laughs> in terms of an upper bound. Um, lower bound in terms of time, you could you might just have one exam to write uh, with the society, and then uh, and then wait your three years with, with, with on experience. Yeah. 
you know you know you you keep on throwing these terms and uh, i think the people who gonna watch this who are mathematics and stats enthusiast i think earlier on you spoke about um i th- i can't remember the question that i asked but you talk you spoke about the distribution of your mm-hmm. answer and now you're talking about the lower bound and the upper bound i'm just thinking in my head that will, that that will come out to be quite interesting for the students who are into statistics and mathematical sciences so that's something mm-hmm. to note um mm-hmm. so um the other question that came through whatsapp uh, was that uh uh how much demanding is an actuarial work like do they knock off too late or they are just like other professions working from 9 to 5 thank you uh you asking how how demanding actual work is yeah that's the question the question says okay, yeah, sure. how sorry because uh, the question keeps going you, you keep talking once the question has ended i don't know what's going on uh, yeah so so look uh, and, uh, and maybe i must address the, the the thing that we talked about earlier that I, I wanted to address is you know with hindsight what i've realized is that almost a, you can be anything you want to be and this is not me being somebody so you you can in, in any profession you can be an actor you can be an engineer but what dictates how well you do that is you know it's really how you apply yourself in it so um be it if, even if it's questions of financial reward salaries and so on um i wouldn't actually say now unequivocally that actuaries earn more than anybody i would actually say the person who's good at what they do will probably earn more than their peers but that, that's me that's mainly packed on the side and that also talks to the the, the work element in that uh you know some people would actually you know live at whatever time it really depends on the kind of role uh, and the sort of time yeah it really depends on the individual and the role they've taken and um, you know and actual work in some cases is very seasonal in that you know this you know financial year ends uh, you know might be for somebody who's valuing the business uh, might be a time at which you know they are particularly busy versus other times um and then some other people are consultants you know then they're subject to you know to their client seasons which might all coincide at the same time and so on so it really varies from role and individual um but on average i mean you guys and very well on average yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so the guys in investments would say yeah so so the beta is good in that you know what the market does for you know for just value of pets pets being in the industry and perhaps being you know being in the industry and perhaps being you know for some point you know some sort of scarce deal so there's some compensation for that uh, but that does on the average and then the alpha which you know is op- almost open to everybody uh, you know the, the, it is is that unique differentiator how 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 you know how much you 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 invest in your development and so on and so on so i would say and in most cases uh, and again this is this is for the capm guys uh, so so uh, the alpha is, is is probably the more significant in where you want to go than you know just belonging to it's good but it, you, i think most people aspire for more what is the alpha the beta uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so so i'm abstracting that from you know um cap, uh, asset pricing model so usually there is uh, you know the, the yeah, sorry oh okay yeah you continue yeah yeah so so I'm, i'm i'm abstracting that from asset pricing models where you've got uh, a beta which is essentially a return that's driven by your relation to the market you know so basically where the market is going Uh, and then there's the alpha element which is essentially you know some unique intrinsic factors that you know you can make you know to increase the return and uh, so so in this case um yeah that that that's sort of you know you know i'm saying you know by you know the latter part uh, which is you know the intrinsic elements that the individual uh, sort of ability to drive yourself through your career um is probably you know more significant when it comes to things like earnings and progression and stuff like that but you know I, i'm still also relatively new in this in this stuff but that's what i've seen i've seen that there is well you know you know good actuaries don't earn significantly more than good engineers and so on let me ask a very naive question very naive yeah. um when you qualified as an actuary uh obviously you do the paperwork and everything like that when your salary clocked probably on your phone 
Mm-hmm. Did that salary shock you or it didn't shock you at all? Uh, <laughs> look, yeah. let me try and remember. To be honest, no. Because well, the, the way these things work, right? Uh, it, it's, it's not the drama that people talk about. And this is not the, the you, know, you know. So what happened is, you, the way you do it is there is some form of progression. Right? So you, you write the exams, your salary increases by some factor. You write the next one, your salary increases by some factor. So you, you're not necessarily going through this you know, large discontinuity in salary, but you're actually going to have some steps that will most move the transition. So you know, probably at point of qualifying, you're looking at 20%, you know, 30% type of increase in salary. Not, it's not necessarily that that big bump that, um, you know, and maybe I'm speaking for me, but, but yeah, for me, it wasn't that. And, and that's sort of what I understand the actual study policies of different organizations look like. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah. So one of the questions that came through as well was, uh, the question reads as follows. It says, as an undergraduate actuarial science student, I'd like to know if it really worth it to follow the wider fields instead mm-hmm. of following the traditional actuarial roles. Um, again, this, this, this are, are individual decisions that are often particularly based on interest, right? So you kind of like have to couple interest and skill and, and see what comes out of that. So in my view, if you're interested in the wider fields, why not? Um, you know, if you're interested in, in the traditional roots, there's certainly no reason not to. Um, but but it's quite important that you do something you enjoy, you know. They sort of you know fought, because uh, if you if you if you sort of enjoy something and you have a skill in it, you will do well. But if you don't, even if you have a skill, in most cases those two are correlated. But if you know if you don't enjoy something, you're not going to do well. You're not going to enjoy it, and so on. So it it really functions on if you're interested in technology, find out what. Actuaries who work in, in, with technologies actually do, um, and, and invest the time in that. Uh, but it's, it's it, it is worth investing time in, in, in looking at at wider fields. But that's a question that's particular to an individual. Another question which I find very quite interesting, uh, especially looking at what you have done as well, mm-hmm. um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and that kind of work, which has more to do with programming and coding. Um, so the question says, as programming is really not a major in actuarial science, at least mm-hmm. not where I'm studying. So this person is studying at uh, Stellenbosch University. Mm-hmm. So the question says, does he think knowing how to code is really beneficial for an actuary? I would say certainly. Uh, I think it, 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 it's a fundamental global question. Knowing how to code is becoming an essential skill. You kind of like need to learn the art of giving computers instructions, because that allows you to, you know, to you know, to outsource, uh, you know, some of the more mundane tasks, uh, and perhaps to get access to computing powers for some of the more com- complex stuff. So I think it's certainly important. Um, and it's certainly clipping into a lot of the syllabi. So I would say, you know, if, if, you, I mean, if you're studying statistics these days, you're most likely, uh, you know, exposed to the R programming language. Uh, so, you know, and that, in this case, it's, it's becoming increasingly general purpose. Um, and with programming, the nice thing is it, it, it's transferable. So, you know, if you learn an object-oriented language, you can certainly, you know, move on from one to the other and so on and so on. It's, it's almost like... Uh, you know, the central kernel is pretty much the same. Uh, so I think it's, it's, learn, it's worth learning how to code. If it's, if it's not necessarily in your curricula, it's worth spending time trying to, to get that in because it's, it, it's, it's a core skill. Um, it, it's a core skill uh, that, 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 you know, I don't think it's going to go away in future. Definitely it is. I'm-